Mary Tam, Second Generation, The Autobiography, Volume 2, read by The Time Keys, Romana. Chapter 12, Who's Behind You? I had been at a Doctor Who convention in Chicago the previous year and had had a raucous time one night singing along to the piano in the hospitality suite as we Who thesps relaxed between panels. I launched into a piercing rendition of Aquarius from the musical Hair, which I had seen and loved in the 60s in London. Indeed, many readers of the first volume of my autobiography, First Generation, will remember how I sang another song from Hair, Frank Mills, for my first Birmingham rap audition. Among the other guests at the con were erstwhile Who director Fiona Cumming and her husband Ian Fraser, who had been a production manager on the series. I noticed Ian and Fiona eyeing me rather thoughtfully and then whispering into the ear of John Nathan Turner, or JNT for short, who was also there. He had taken over as producer on Doctor Who just after my departure from the show and I had known him as a production unit manager during my stint. When John called me some months later to ask if I would like to appear in a pantomime with other actors from Who, which he was producing along with Fiona and Ian, I realized what the whispering in Chicago had been about. That had been my audition, and I had obviously passed. I would not call myself a serious singer, even though my mama had sung and taught opera, but I can hold a note and stay in tune. As my agent at the time, John Redway, pronounced, there were others with better voices, but I'd never done a panto before and could not wait to start rehearsals for this new and hopefully wonderful experience. We duly met up one chilly November morning at the Questers Theatre in Ealing, with John and Ian presiding, and Gary Down John's boyfriend, along as choreographer. The pantomime was Cinderella, which John had written. Most modern-day pantos consist of a bare skeleton of a story fleshed out with witty dialogue to reflect topical issues in the style of jokes, songs, and satire. And we were to perform it in Southampton at the Gaumont Theatre as well as myself playing Prince Charming. Our jolly cast of players included Colin Baker, the present on-screen incarnation of the Doctor, giving his buttons, Anthony Ainley, the master, doing Baron Hardup, Nicola Bryant as Cinders, and last but not least, Jacqueline Pierce as the Fairy Godmother. Although not in Who, Jackie had famously played Cervellin in Blake 7 and was rightly considered a bit of a draw for sci-fi fans. The following year saw her make a guest appearance in The Two Doctors, probably as a direct result of her time in the panto. I was staggered upon meeting Nicola to discover that she was actually British. So good and convincing was her American accent as Perry, Colin's companion, on screen that I'd been completely fooled. She and I had many romantic duets together, so were thrown into each other's company quite a lot during the weeks of rehearsal. Colin was our star and twinkled brightly throughout. It was lovely to see him again. I had known him as a friend many years previously, when I was a RADA student and my fellow's friend had been his girlfriend. Of course, we had met up on the convention circuit previously, but the opportunities for chat and reminiscence on those occasions had been all too brief. Now we had time for plenty of long natters. I had only met Anthony Ainley twice previously, once in Chicago where I remembered him giving a brilliant cabaret rendition of the eponymous song dedicated to that great city, and secondly at a hookon in Birmingham, under somewhat strange circumstances. Marcus and I had arrived fairly late on the Friday night and had repaired to our hotel room at about midnight. I was just drifting off into a peaceful slumber when the door handle rattled. There was the sound of a key turning in the lock and someone burst noisily into the room. The lights were turned on to full beam and there stood the master, aka Mr. Ainley, staring down at us in disbelief. What the F are you doing in my room? He spluttered angrily, suing in his suitcase to the floor. Marcus was groggily coming to and had heard the query. What the F are you doing in our room? He reposted. Oh, he was as sharp as a rapier. Anthony looked bemused as the gradual dawning flickered over his features that he knew us both from somewhere. He finally got it. Mary? Mama.
Marcus, he remembered. How are you? Lovely to see you again. We all shook hands somewhat awkwardly, with Marcus and I covering up our obvious nakedness with the rather inadequate bedclothes and Anthony reddening by the second. He picked up his case and then backed out of the room, even switching the light off as he went. We discovered the con organizers had made up a bit of a cock-up with our rooms, double-booking the three of us into the same one, and they were most contrite the following day. We thought it was hilarious, however, and dined out on the story for years after. Jackie was huge fun to work with, and we kept in touch for many months after the panto was over. She lived in a houseboat on the River Thames at Chelsea, and I had so many afternoons sipping tea with her there. The interior was festooned with Christmas decorations, which Jackie could never bear to take down. She would stare fondly out over the waters and tenderly refer to me as Mare, which coincidentally is the Estonian spelling of my name, M-A-R-E, although it is pronounced with the stress on the last E, Marie, while I addressed her as Jack. Look at the river, Mare. Isn't she adorable? Gorgeous, Jack, I would reply wistfully. An inherently eccentric but lovely soul, our Jackie. When we were settled into performance in Southampton, the cast would make a habit of repairing to the Italian restaurant next door to the theatre after the show. Jack would leave her dressing room in a very shabby, faded blue, threadbare, toweling dressing gown, throw a glamorous fur coat over it, and then sit in the restaurant with the fur draped over her shoulders and the ghastly robe peeking out from underneath, and still managing to look glam. I now hear, at the time of writing this, that she is rescuing endangered monkeys in Africa. What a gal! The grueling rehearsal period was hard work but fun, as we hoofed and sang from morning till night. Nicola turned out to be quite a nifty little tapper, and passed her skills on to the rest of the cast. We had two wonderful old queens, David Raven and James Court, alias the Trollettes, playing the ugly sisters, Maisie and Samantha, as well as a very enthusiastic complement of professional dancers who really gave the show its pizzazz. And then, of course, there were us thesps, such as we were. As I said before, my singing was okay, but nothing special. Nicola and Anthony were pretty good, and Colin was okay too, so all in all, we did not disgrace ourselves too badly, until, of course, the dreaded spectre of corpsing reared its ugly head. Again, I had a duet with a lovely girl called Jill Nada, who was playing Dandina. Shortly after my first entrance as Prince Charming, or PC, to my friends, we launched into Wherever We Go, the classic Jules Stein, Stephen Sondheim number from Gypsy, which consisted of us marching across the stage and singing alternate lines as we progressed. Ergo, it went something like this, PC. Wherever we go, whatever we do, we're gonna go through it together. D. We may not go far, but sure as a star, whatever we are, it's together. PC. Wherever I go, I know he goes. D. Wherever I go, I know he goes. PC. No fits, no fights, no feuds, and no egos. Both amigos together. It was an easy number, with little vocal range required. Just a smile and a swagger, really. Jill was a professional singer, and so really made me look good in this one. It all went swimmingly until our first matinee, when, unbeknownst to us, a large school party came in, consisting of a great many pre-adolescent boys who, naturally enough, whistled and roared with raucous approval when Jill and I entered, with our brocade jacket tops skimming the tops of our bottoms, and our legs encased in fishnet tights and high heels. J and T had decided to go the old-fashioned route with a hero's role, having a girl, aka yours truly, take the role, instead of opting for the modern trend for having a boy or man do it. Consequently, the sight of two scantily clad women proved too much for our audience that day. The shouts grew louder and louder, and as the orchestra struck up the opening notes of our song's intro, I felt the familiar desire to snigger, to which I unwisely gave way. Now, as my readers already know, I had had quite a few problems with corpsing in the past. Somehow, though, with spoken dialogue, one can overcome the beast by garbling something, anything, to finish a scene and then get off stage. I was about to find out that it is impossible to rectify the problem whilst singing. At the risk of stating the obvious, you have to sing notes specifically. You have to sing them at a given time and in a given rhythm. 
I managed my first line somewhat breathily. Wherever we go, whatever we do, we're gonna go through it together. And Jill, trooper that she was, strongly sang the second. We may not go far, but sure as a star, wherever we are, it's together. And then I corpsed, and believe me, it is just not possible to exhale on a laugh and sing at the same time. There was a silence where my line should have been, and Jill then gamely countered with hers. Another silence that a trill from Jill, and so on and so on, until the song was finished. I saw the sound guy frantically fiddling with his little knobs and dials, desperately trying to work out why my radio mic was not working, but to no avail. I had to go round and apologize to him later, and mortifyingly explain why he had not heard my singing. Shame on Mary. Again. However, in my defense, it was not entirely my fault that it had all gone awry. The company all shared a wicked sense of humor, and laughter and jokes had been the norm right from day one of rehearsals. We had played practical jokes on each other, and in performance there was, I ashamedly admit, a competition to see who could corpse whom on stage. I am mentioning no names here, you understand. But certain individuals made it a priority to twinkle a performer's term which refers to a look in another performer's eye during a scene which is, by nature, serious. The look says, hello, I know this is meant to be a somber scene, but I dare you to smile. Go on, I dare you. And so, of course, one inevitably does, and then both or several of you are heaving with silent mirth on stage and wiping tears afterwards whilst blaming everyone else for setting you off. So far, we had all fallen victim to the curse of the corpse. All, that is, except Colin. The worst moment had been during the scene where Cinderella has to leave the ball as the clock strikes midnight and runs up a wide staircase, leaving her high-heeled slipper behind. My usual move was to take a few steps after her, crying, Wait! Wait! But she flees the ballroom. I then notice the slipper, which I pick up and sing a tender solo to afterwards, on a dramatically dimmed stage and under a single spotlight. On one fateful evening, Nicola turned as the chimes began to strike and began to make her way upstage to the foot of the staircase. I followed her, but instead of fleeing for me, she appeared to be floundering and fighting to keep a balance. I drew near, saying my line of, wait, wait even as I drew level with her, wondering why the hell she wasn't scampering nimbly up the steps as usual. When she hissed out of the corner of her mouth, my heel stuck! I was almost next to her by now and glanced surreptitiously downwards to see her foot twisting in desperation to try and lift herself out of the wretched shoe. I improvised my voice shrill with panic. Please don't leave yet! We have not danced the waltz! <laughs> the waltz! The ugly sisters, who were sniggering nearby, now stifled gales of laughter. Nicola started to shake, then I was off too. She finally managed to lift her foot out of the slipper and ran up the stairs to the safety of the wings platform, where I could hear her laughing her head off. The sisters noisily escaped too, and I knelt to try and lift the slipper from where it was firmly wedged between the cracks of two floorboards. I had a nasty moment when I could not make it move, but then, with a quick snap, I broke the heel and cradled the innocent little shoe in my hands. I was shining breathless with sweat and terror by now, and my hysterical mirth was not subsiding. The lights dropped. I found my spotlight, and as the violins wistfully drew out the opening bars of the intro, I took some awesomely deep, deep breaths and began Be My Love, a poignant old song that had been made famous by the world-famous tenor Mario Lanza, one of my mum's favourite singers. At the thought of my mother, a professional singer herself, I quickly sobered up, imagining how ashamed of me she would be if she were here now, and I messed up. The song went okay, if a little breathily, and I stumbled off the stage in the ensuing blackout, profusely thanking all the theatre gods from keeping me from corpsing mid-song. Colin was chortling in the wings when I came off, and then swept onto the stage with not as much as a twinkle to play his next scene. How did he do it? He never, ever corpsed! I resolved then and there to get him. Towards the end of the run, at a matinee performance, my daughter Lauren, who was five at the time, came to see the show, the first time she had ever seen me on stage. 
It was a panto tradition to invite some children up onto the stage towards the end of the evening, ask them a few questions, give out toys, throw sweets into the auditorium, and commence an audience sing-along complete with giant song sheet high above the scenery. This was in actual fact a ruse to give all the other members of the cast and chorus the time needed for their elaborate costume change for the closing number of the panto. This involved the traditional walk-down where all the characters dressed in unimaginably glamorous, glittering outfits, walk down a grand central staircase to the front of the stage to take a bow and then fall back into a semicircle to sing the final song as a full company. Colin, as Buttons, shouted out an invitation to any kids in the audience that would like to come up and meet him. Lauren had been primed. She ran up as fast as Bandersnatch and arrived, panting with pride, with several other children that had made it. I was watching in the wings and, as usual, felt mightily sorry for the little ones who had to be turned away. Elf and safety decreed only a certain number could be allowed up even back in those days. I did admit to a certain maternal pride, though, that Lauren had been so swift. Colin asked the children questions, and when he got to Lauren, he said, And who did you like best in the show? To which my loyal daughter replied, My mummy. This drew a huge laugh from the audience and an even bigger one when Colin explained who Mummy was, adding darkly, it's a fix. The days of Ponto were drawing to an end. It had been a tremendous success, and we had managed to fill the cavernous Gaumont Theatre almost to full capacity for three weeks. I still had not made Colin corpse, and neither had anyone else. It had become an obsession with us all, and I decided that drastic measures were needed. J&T had rather pompously banned any practical jokes, twinkles, or off-the-cuff humor on the last night. Did he not realize that it was another panto tradition that anything went as far as the last night was concerned? We decided to ignore him, but first... I put on a cunning plan to practice on the last matinee day. Colin had a scene where he was alone on stage with several young performers from a local dance school, all of whom worked very hard and loved the chance of being in a professional stage show. They ranged in age from about 6 to 13 years. I stood in the wings and waited till Colin was facing me full on and then whipped open my dressing gown to reveal my knickers, nothing else. That'll get him, I thought. Well, it didn't. Colin looked, took a beat, and then carried on as if nothing had happened. Damn, would this man ever crack up? I stomped away from the wings in disappointment, thwarted yet again by Mr. Cool. The next day I got a severe reprimand from J&T. Not only was my behavior unprofessional, he told me, but there had been a couple of complaints from mothers of the stage school children, whose offspring wanted to know if it was normal for actresses to stand semi-nude in the wings. I was mortified. I'd completely forgotten about the kids on stage, so focused had I been on Mr. Baker. I refused to be cowed about the practical joke, however. We were all trying to get Colin now, especially as he had got all of us at some time or other during the run. We only had the last night now. Payback time. An announcement was put out over the tannoy before the beginning of the last show, warning us all that we must not, under any circumstances, try and do or say anything silly that evening. It was a great and hearty shame to spoil our fun, but we all complied by being as good as gold and Colin reigned triumphant as the King of Cool. I'm gonna get you someday, though, Baker. You wait and see.